So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to how you first got into science fiction and fantasy. What sort of stuff were you reading when you were growing up? What were you uh, interested in? Uh, well, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy, oddly enough. Um, so so my, my dad was a member of a, of a science fiction book club. Um, so, so we used to get all sorts of weird and wonderful, and in hindsight, yes, they were quite weird, some of them, um, <laughs> books once, once a month. And, and I just kind of got interested in these weird things that were showing up. And I, I remember once picking up a Philip K. Dick and going, should I read this? And, and I was told, no, no, you probably shouldn't read that. Oh, wow. you, should try, you should try and read this. So, well, I, well, I mean, Dick is not the best entry point for a 10 year old into science fiction i reckon <laughs> uh, so he uh, he put rendezvous with rama in my hands instead which was possibly a better choice um i don't remember how exactly i got into fantasy but i'm pretty sure it was i know i know i really struggled with the lord of the rings at the first attempt mm. um but but not at the second I think that was probably what got pushed at me to begin with, because my, my parents were quite reader, readers, but they weren't, apart from my dad's science fiction collection, they weren't like, genre readers at all. Uh, they just read a bit of everything. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I had a friend who got me into murder mysteries. I read, I must have read about 50 Agatha Christie's <laughs> in, 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 in the space of about three years. Um, so I ended up yeah, reading quite a lot of, of, of that kind of thing as well, and other, and other bits and pieces. But it, by, by the time I had any kind of reading habits, it was definitely settled in on science fiction and, and, and fantasy, particularly fantasy. So yes, I, I was... Oh, yes, and then Dungeons and Dragons didn't help there either. Yeah. <clears throat> all, the, all the old... Uh, get out the old 10D and uh, 20D and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got my dice collection somewhere around here in a bag, gathering dust, sadly, but... I remember that in the early days, we just nick characters from the books we'd been reading, and, and that would be our character, and then <laughs> we'd try and do the things that the characters did, and it didn't work because we were first level, and they were like 56 level, obviously, or something like that. Just get squashed. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears> when, <throat> when did it transition from, you know, from reading all this stuff, when did you first attempt to write a proper, a full novel? Well, I first started. Uh, I first started a novel when I was about sixteen, I think, back in the days where we did not have word processors. We had typewriters. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if you if you're not old enough to remember writing on a typewriter, then you just don't know what you're what what, what you're missing, because you know, cut and paste literally was cut and paste. And if you got if you messed up a page, you had to do it all again. Yeah, and that was quite tedious. So I never finished that novel. Um, but I did start one. I got 50, 60 pages, something like that. Mm. Um, it really was terrible. Really, really quite bad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Uh, and I it must, have been, it must have been in my early, tw early 20s after I'd been to university and we actually had discovered the existence of computers and word processors. And now you could cut and paste and life was without having to do an entire new page and mash your fingers to death. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and I was still kind of set on writing that same novel because um, I thought it, I thought it had something. Uh, it didn't, spoiler right. alert, but anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> because I was still stupid. Um, and what I realized though, was that, was that because I'd originally come up with this idea as a, as a, as a campaign setting for a role-playing game, there was a lot of setup. A lot of things had happened to lead to the point at which the part, the the, the player characters were going to join the story. Mm. And what it really needed was it was really part two of a trilogy, and I should go away and write part one. So I went away and I wrote part one, and it was terrible. <laughs> right. um, <clears throat> honestly, it was more. I, I don't. I don't think I have any of it left any of those early drafts any of the, anywhere but but i think eh, i've got some of the later works and even that which i know is considerably better is still as about as exciting as watching paint dry um, <clears throat> it was almost like a i don't know victorian chronicle of an of, of an exploration where everything was incredibly dry and detailed but 
and, and, and lengthy descriptions and absolutely no character or life to it whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> and, but I did write it, I did finish it. Um, and I showed it to a friend who was polite enough to say it could do with some work. Right. Um, uh, and introduced me to the idea of characters right that 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 was suggested that was quite important in a story to have characters that <laughs> weren't just like the narrator of this journey um, so i wrote it again and and that yeah that that was a finished book and 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 and, and it's still awful um but what's awful about it is that the prose is incredibly stilted. Um, it's actually not too bad in terms of character and plot, that one. Mm. Um, <clears throat> uh, so that was the first book that I wrote. Never got published, and it probably never will. And if it does, that will mean basically taking the characters and the plot and starting again with the actual writing of it, um, which isn't. A huge amount of fun actually when you know everything that happens in a story already it's not that much fun to write it anymore no i don't want to go back to any of my trunk novels and see how bad they are or revisit any of the characters i don't think i want to do that i want to move forward um, but it does have a bearing to the moon still crown um because one thing that happened, oh yeah, hello, it's this the is cat. a cat's tail. Yeah, yeah, there'll, there'll be a few of those. <laughs> one of mine will come by in a minute as well. You'll see there's occasional fluffy brush will sort of wander by. Yeah, I get, I get that to mine. <laughs> um, so, so one thing that I discovered uh, when writing a book which actually had characters in it who thought, thought and acted in a sort of coherent, humanish kind of way that wasn't necessarily what you wanted them to do was that sometimes, well, if they didn't do what you wanted them to do, in fact, sometimes when despite being absolutely critical to the existence of the sequel they would go and get themselves killed because that was what they would set out to do to atone for the thing that you made them do early on and then you go mm, okay well i fucked that one up then didn't i um, <laughs> <laughs> and and to some extent that the the, the moon steel crown is the replacement for that very very first novel it, it it's the sequel it follows on from the events that are in the novel that was supposed to be the prequel to some different events. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, so there, that, it's, it's, I've gone full circle. It's only taken mm, 30, uh, 35 years, something like that. <laughs> wow. Okay. We'll, we'll come, we'll come back to the Moonsteel crown, but your, your first, uh, published novel was was the adamantine palace i believe in 2009 is that yeah. right yeah was that the first book you went out <clears throat> on submission for two agents or was it no was... no it wasn't and, and uh, yeah okay you know how everyone tells you that the thing you should do is write a really good novel and get it as good as you can and then you go out and you look for an agent using the writers and artists yearbook and eventually, if your novel is good enough, you will get picked up by an agent. And eventually, if your novel is good enough, your agent will get you a publisher. Um, I think I can count on the fingers of one hand the numbers of number of authors I know for whom that's actually what happened. Right. Uh, and I am not among that number. Uh, so yeah, I, I did write several novels. Mm -hmm. um, I three, three or three or four um, after that first one, and they they, they steadily got a, they steadily got better. Um, uh, they still exist, and I still read them and go, "Whoa, <laughs> you still can't write." <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, but 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 what <laughs> what actually happened was that I I decided that that I needed to get this this first book that I had actually finished, I needed to get it out of my head. I right. needed to get, I needed to move on from it because I kept on going back to it and I kept on rewriting it and I just couldn't leave it alone. And it did get better at every attempt, but there was only so far it was going to get. Um, and it needed to just be somehow exercised and so I could, so I could move on to other things. I had already moved on to some other things, but I, it was, I kept coming back to this. So I decided I was going to self-publish it. It's back in the day when that meant actually printing copies and taking them to bookshops. Kindle didn't exist. Yep. 
Um, and I got as far as getting, I actually employed a copy editor who was okay and an editor who wasn't, uh, and got some arcs printed. Yep. And then, because you could do this back then, because people weren't doing it all the time and therefore you could get hold of authors email addresses i emailed every single fantasy author there was and asked if they'd be willing to read it uh, don't do this by the way <laughs> don't do this now kids. don't do this <laughs> <laughs> whatever you do don't do, don't, email don't do us. this i'll ask us to read your books because <clears throat> uh, that was then and it was different then yeah. um so and i got three replies um uh, which is probably, by current standards, a pretty good hit rate. Mm. Uh, and two of them agreed to do it, which was, by That's current nice. standards, an amazing hit rate. And the third reply, who didn't agree to do it and just told me that I shouldn't do this, happened to be George R. R. Martin. <laughs> like, believe it or not. Wow. And what's more, when I met him 20 years later at a convention, he remembered, oh, no. which was quite scary. Oh, no. He wasn't quite the thing back in the, that day as, as, he, as he was now. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I sent this off and I got, I got a positive response from, from uh, uh, and some useful feedback from one of the, one of the authors, from KJ Parker. I, I, should, I should come out and say KJ Parker was a, was, did this and, and, uh, and the fact that any of the rest happened was uh, in part down to the fact that he did. Uh, and I was a big KJ Parker fan and still am, but I'm a bigger fan now. <laughs> after that. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so I got some 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 general sort of notes back saying, yeah, there are some there's some stuff in this you might want to address in a kind of global kind of way. Like I think his quote was, "This is like trying to drink undiluted orange juice." Right. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, <clears throat> but he pointed me to. Uh, John Gerald, who I don't know whether John had ever been his editor, but they certainly knew each other because um, it was a it was a smaller world then. Um, who was just setting up as an agency and said you should take this to him. Um, so I did, and uh, and possibly I, I don't I don't know how much the fact that I was able to say oh look this vaguely famous fantasy author has said these things and suggested you whether that helped but i'm sure th these days that sort of thing certainly does help and mm. um, and he took it on and i don't I, to this day i don't know why because it's still crap it really <laughs> isn't well written <laughs> but anyway uh so he took me on and he never managed to sell it because the editors around the place sort of thought yeah but it's crap um but i wrote three more novels it did the job of getting that book out of my head anyway. Yeah. I ended up writing, I think, at, I think three, maybe four, sort of losing count, uh, novels after that. Uh, all fantasy, all set in the same kind of multiverse, uh, which he didn't manage to sell. Um, but then one day he got back in touch with me and said, uh, this editor at Golantz is looking for someone to write them some dragon-based fantasy. Are you interested? Uh, now, you'd never say no to something like that, right? <laughs> when you're trying to get in. No, it's not my cup of tea. I just don't want to do it, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, mate, you're Do you need right. to be published? No. No. Who wants Dragons, that? meh. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, there was lots of frantic brainstorming. And two months later, on the basis of a synopsis and 10,000 word sample, they gave me a contract. Wow. Um, yeah. So that was how it, that's how, that was how it started. Um, and they, they sold it. They had, their, they had made their money back by selling the German rights before I'd finished writing it as well. Okay. Um, so they were happy. So the Germans weren't, I think, but <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> that came later. Um, yeah, so they were riding. They were riding high on the back of having put out uh, Joe Abercrombie and Pat Rothfuss and Scott Lynch all within the space of the last two or three years, and just basically everything they touched was gold. So anyone they took on was getting just snapped up left, right, and centre. 
um, without even being read. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore either, I'm afraid. So yes, I was very lucky. Um, I worked, I, I did work hard, but I also happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and that's a, that turns out to be a lot of people's stories in different ways. You, you have to work a lot to get yourself into the right place at the right time. Um, but there is quite a random chance to whether you happen to be that, you know, when that will come along. That's yeah. how it started. Yes, they took, they took the adamantine palace on the basis of that. And two, thousand, no, two years, two years later, no, it was less than that. It was very the back end of 2007. So it was, no, sorry, it was the very back end of 2006. So yeah, two years later, there it was in bookshops and I was wow. very happy. Wow. I remember seeing you at a uh, Derby festival, one of the ones they used to do there. Oh, out at, fiction, at, yeah. At the quad. Yeah. And, uh, in between panels, you were sat on your laptop, tap, <laughs> working away on something at the time. I was like, okay, oh, you're well, working yeah. on the next book. <laughs> Probably. <clears throat> yeah. Frantically working away on something you were at the time. Well, uh, to, because the Adamantine, because the Adamantine Palace did so well before anyone had actually read it and being able to form a real actual opinion about it, um, they, 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 they just kept on throwing work at me for a bit. Um, so they, they, uh, I'm not sure the Adamantine Palace was even published before they asked me whether I wanted to do, well, they couched it as a YA series. Yeah, it was pretty, it was, a, it was supposed to be a YA fantasy series for them, which was, which became the Thief Taker's Apprentice, and which is why it does have a bit of a YA feel to it, especially the first book. Right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and yeah, you don't say no to publishing contracts at that stage of your career. So yeah, you sit in whatever corner you can and you write away. <laughs> it's it, Every time I ask this question, because every time I ask people, the answer is always a bit different. How they got in, how they got an agent, how they got published, you know, what book they got published on. Because some people say, oh, I got an agent and then my first book the with them went out. And some people say... I had an agent and I with them for years. And then my seventh book with them was the one that actually got published. It's never the same story twice. No, it's not. You know, never. It, it, it's just every time, because people are always looking for that silver bullet. And I'm constantly explaining that there isn't, there isn't one or, you know, like I've had someone say to me, well, I want this book to be my debut, the one that'll come out. And I'm thinking, that's not, that's not up to you. You're not going to control if that's your debut. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that, that, that's a thing. Everyone has this story. And I say, no, there is the way you're supposed to do it. No one does it that way, though. And everyone knows that no one actually did it that way. The trouble is no one, there's no consistency to how it happened for us. We, you, you, you work hard and you try to put yourself in a place where you can take advantage of an opportunity if it comes, but you can't make that opportunity happen. You can make it, you can affect the chances of it happen, but, but you can't control it. Um, and I think a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. It's yeah. just the way it is. I'm sorry, it's the whole of life is like that. It's putting in the work and hoping it lands at the right time, right desk at the right time, um, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it left me wondering, for example, my, my agent was, was John Gerald, but he had been an editor and I had submitted work to him as an editor in the past, but I hadn't submitted that book because I thought the other one was better. And yet he took the one I didn't submit on when he was an agent. And I still kick myself thinking, well, what if I submitted the other one back then? <laughs> this is what started five years sooner. <sighs> No, it's you just, just can't. You just have to move on from that. Yeah, yeah. This is it. This is true. Um, so anyway, so you did the Alman Pans and the trilogy, and then you did the uh, three books, sort of YA thief type books, and then you went into sci-fi. Is that right? But under a pen name. Well, <clears throat> I did some more fantasy for Golans first. Um, so they, after the the Adamantan Palace series, they asked for more. Mm. Um, and uh, so, so that that resulted in the uh, 
four four more books with Drag dragons in and and to be honest although those books didn't do terribly well i do think that the dragon queen trilogy probably remains my best writing um at least for a while i think it's the best fantasy i've done up until the moon steel crown obviously that one's better buy that oh, one oh, yes yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um before i forget because we could we're going to forget and i always forget this do this at the end there's a link down below in the show notes that's to the broken binding where you can get signed copies with book plates for the run steel crown which is behind me and the cow which is my book they're both out from angry robot books yours is out now mine is out june the 8th and they're both brilliant yes brilliant the discount code as well so you're better off <laughs> using that so there you go discount for everybody yeah good so you did more fantasy, uh, another more dragon books. Yeah, um, and I tried to be clever with those, and I tried to tie in the two previous, so the Thief Takers trilogy and the previous Dragon trilogy, uh, because there were there were some cunning links supposed to be there, and uh, and it tried to pull them together. And some people hated that, and some people really got off on it. Sources for courses, I suppose. Well, it's expanded universe. People <laughs> love that stuff now. It's like the yeah, Marvel yeah. universe. Everything's yeah. connected, and everything's inter interconnected. So why wouldn't you want to do that? You know? Yeah. Um, you have and your I really, time. And then Golantz had this idea that, that that they wanted to do some Gemmel-like fantasy. So could I write them a quick trilogy? Yeah, quick uh, um, of, of something that was much more sword and sorcery. So so I did three, and those were going to get published back to back you know one every three months i remember these this is under a pen name though was this nathan Hawk? nathan hawk yeah uh, um so i went through i went through a year two, two years where i actually pushed out four books a year wow and that was absolutely knackering that that's was. insane um <clears throat> i was writing full time at that time right. but even then it's just killing to, to push that much out uh, i couldn't have done it for much for more time for, for any longer than that um and it became obvious that that despite the fact that the adamantine palace had done fairly well um the both the nathan hawk books and the second dragon series books i mean they, they did okay but they weren't going to do what the first trilogy had done uh and it wasn't really viable to be to to to, uh, they couldn't be my only source of income. It was just far too flaky because I had two young kids. I was the only source of income for the whole household, that kind of thing. Mm. So, so that kind of had to stop. Um, I couldn't put. I, I, I couldn't write enough books, even full time, to pay the mortgage, and so I had to not write full time, which meant I couldn't write nearly as many books. <laughs> so I ended up taking a little bit of a break to sort of get. <laughs> cover basically um <clears throat> and yeah i i then went back to uh, i then, then went, went went back to Golentz after after a bit of a break and, and um pitched them this sci-fi series um as sam peters which is i supposed to be kind of like a sort of sci-fi noir thriller is arguably cyberpunk arguably not it's got some of the tropes but not all of them but it is it is very kind of noiry and conspiracy and and, and it's a bit more sci-fi than cyberpunk usually is um <clears throat> but essentially yeah, the, the the core trope where where the uh yeah the main character is is he, he believes his wife has died in a uh, in, in an accident and can't get over it and brings 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 her back as a as an as, as an, uh, an artificial intelligence using all the uh, that's got all of her memories that he can get hold of so anything that's sort of anything that's available from sort of the the, the sci-fi equivalent of cctv and and social media all that kind of thing so it knows what she looked like to the public but it's but it doesn't get to know the real person so it's, it's a simulation of the outside of person but it has not doesn't have the same interior thoughts yeah and that all got quite interesting because well what does that mean it's not the same person it's trying to simulate a person but it is an intelligence in its own right and it knows that it isn't that person um and then it starts to so they they're, and then they're investigating this murder uh together only they kind of possibly start to have divergent 
uh, goals. So, so he wants to know what happened. Yeah. But the artificial intelligence is, well, I'm beginning to guess, I'm beginning to work out what happened. And I'm not sure I want him to know because that has consequences for me that I don't <laughs> think I like because I'm supposed to be the replacement. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and so, so that, yeah, that that was a lot of fun with us sort of messing around with their minds. And there's lots of like other stuff going on as well. But that was the kind of the core of the trilogy was the uh, the relationship between this guy's memory between of of the real person, the artificially created memory of that person, and actually the real person themselves through the things that she'd done that he didn't know about but gradually found out about. <laughs> Can't say more than that without spoiling. No, no, no! I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was hard work. I discovered that in that that trying to write a multi-layered thriller is not the same as writing a, a fantasy adventure. If you just say, "Right, characters, this is the situation. This is roughly where we want to end up. Off you go." They go off, and then they, and, it, and then, and then your whole thriller thing doesn't work because they unravel clues in the wrong order and things like that, and 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 they know things before this before they're supposed to, and then you have to sort of take the whole story apart and put it back together again with enormous spreadsheets that make sure that they, the different threads of the story interact with each other at the right times and don't wreck each other instead and turn it all into a great big train wreck. So that was quite hard work, but a lot of fun in the end. Yeah. Did, did the challenge you enjoy with doing something different was it did you like that because it was stretching different muscles you just or did you just want to try something different and see how it, you got on with it um i think i didn't really know what i was letting myself in for yes right. i wanted to stretch different muscles and, and 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 try something different um but this is a bit like going to the gym and doing a bunch of exercises you've never done before you come home and then the next day you really fucking hurt <laughs> it's true <laughs> That machine looks interesting. I'll have a go, and then yeah. you don't. You regret doing it. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I obviously like it enough. I like, oh, I didn't dislike it enough um, because I, I, I seem to be in my spare time. Not that I have much of it. I, I seem to be looking at a time travel sci-fi thing. And if there's anything that's going to need complicated spreadsheets, it's fucking time travel. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But there you go. Um, yeah, I was quite proud of that, actually. It was... Uh, yeah, some of my better books, those were, I think. Um, and they got really exciting because they got options to be made into a TV series. And for years, they were almost being made into a TV series and then they weren't anymore. Oh. Oh. <laughs> But take the free money for a while. So yeah, true. well, it wasn't nothing. That's true. Yeah, free money for for a little while. Yeah, every time there's talk of option, I get excited. My agent says, "Don't get excited." Ninety nine percent of the ones that do get optioned never get made. I was like, oh, "Yeah, oh, all right then. I won't, I won't get excited." Yeah. yeah, but it's still free money while they're all being desperately excited, thinking <laughs> they will make it for you. And, yeah. Uh, which I, I did tell myself I was never going to go back to fantasy after they optioned that because fantasy doesn't get optioned. Uh, not the, not my kind of fantasy anyway, because I'm not the Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones um, or the Wheel of Time um, or, or what's the other one? Witcher, Witcher at the moment. Well, yeah, I see the Witcher kind of broke that. that the Witcher might have made me think, well, maybe it can be, but I mean, there are so many of us writing this kind of fantasy that that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like being struck by a lightning, really. So, yeah, it's, it's basically not going to happen. Um, so I'm not going to do fantasy again. I'm not going to do fantasy again. I'm not going to do fantasy. Oh, yeah, OK, Angry Robot, I'll do fantasy for you. Steve! <laughs> what are you doing? Ah. There you go. Mm. But you also did some historical fantasy, um, which is quite interesting. And is and you did, some, you did a couple of novels about Bulldog Drummond, Oh, right. Yeah, that saga. Uh, but is, is that a public domain character? Or did you write that for the, like, estate or something? Uh, right. No, so the Bulldog Drummond novellas, they are, uh, Bulldog Drummond is public domain. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, so is Sherlock Holmes, although you apparently need to be a bit careful around that. Right. 
um, Bulldog Drummond. Well, in fact, so strictly speaking, it's uh, Conan the Barbarian, but you need to be really, really very careful around that. About that estate, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Bulldog Drummond is public domain. And since no one has done anything with Bulldog Drummond since like the 1950s, uh, it, it's not a minefield the way some of the other characters that ought to be public domain can be. Mm. Uh, and there was a there was a a, a new publisher um, that was setting up that was uh, their shtick was going to be to grab they would just grab loads of old public domain characters. Oh, hello. There goes one of my <laughs> There goes a tail. Let's check for a moment to see whether okay. that was one of yours or one of it's mine. It's one of mine. There he goes. <clears throat> uh, they were they were going to do a bunch of. Um, they were basically going to resurrect a bunch of uh, characters that had moved into the public domain and bring mm. them back to life. Um, and they weren't going to do novels. They were going to do novellas and um, uh, novellas, ebook only, and uh, audio books. Um, <clears throat> and this sounded great, and they were they were prepared to pay money. So all right, um, it was it was reasonable money too. It wasn't. It wasn't for a novella. It was good money. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, okay, I'll 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 do you, I'll do you one of those novellas. No, 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 no. We want three. Uh, okay, three then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I wrote them three the, the these three novellas, and and they they put the first one out, and then nothing happened for a very long time, and they I think they discovered that. I think it came to as almost as a shock to them to discover that ebooks didn't just magically market themselves, mm -hmm. and that if you didn't try to sell them, they didn't sell. Uh, and they didn't, as far as I can tell, they did nothing. I don't know whether they were expecting us to do it, my agent to do it, me to do it, but I didn't have a. I'm not like. I'm a really quite small fish in the author pond, and 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 most of the people who do pay attention to what I do are, if their response is, "Where are the dragons?" If it hasn't got dragons in it, we're not interested, Steve. That's what we bought. That's what we signed up for. Dragons, and and you've had questions, right? We'll get to that, right? <laughs> um. So I think they sold like forty copies, right. or something like that. <laughs> Um, and then they quietly went out of business. Ah, okay. Um, a long time passed, and I have got the rights for those back. And at the moment, I am trying to sell them somewhere else. But they only published one of them. They paid for oh. all three of them, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not unhappy. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd rather have that than Disney. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you might have to edit that out for for, for legal reasons. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they just they just sank. They just disappeared. They didn't try to sell. They didn't after the first one. They just didn't do anything. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that at some point later this year or early next year they will. I'll put them on the you know Kindle Direct or something, or put them on the website as PDFs. I don't care. I've been paid for them. I'll put them out there. Yeah, yeah. Why not? If you got if you got them back and they're done and. They're just gathering dust. Yeah, absolutely. So you then, came, despite swearing that you'd never do fantasy, you came back to fantasy again with the Moonsteel Crown. Yes, yeah. So the Moonsteel Crown is. Tell me about it. <sighs> to some extent, going back to fantasy in this case is a bit of a was a bit of a vanity project, right? Um. Only uh, in this case, I think it's one that's worked out really rather well. Um, so, like I said, that they, back in a long, long time ago, um, I wrote this story that was crap, and then I wrote the prequel to the story that was better, terribly written, and also made the story that I, it was supposed to be the prequel to not work at all. Um, <clears throat> So I found this quite vexing, and 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 
but I, I, I really quite liked the story that I'd written. I, I liked the characters and the world. Yeah. The fact that I couldn't string sentences together in an entertaining way at the time was, well, by the by, it's still like, yeah. yeah. Um, so I used it as a setting for a role-playing game. Um, and I won't go into this too much because I think the Angry Robot podcast, we talk about this a lot. Um, I don't know. So anyway, I used it as a setting as a, for, for a role-playing game and happened to have a bunch of people who were all much more interested in telling an interactive story than they were in hitting things and getting the, getting the loot. Right. Um, so so they, they were much more... They were the kind of players who want you to give them a hard time by making them make difficult choices and then and then and then regretting that regretting them and wishing they'd done things differently <laughs> um they get upset if you just gave them here oh well you got a plus three sword from the dead orc yay <laughs> um which was great um and that allowed me to tell a new story that was a sequel to this other story to this this sort of first novel that i had on the shelf um and I thought it was really rather good. Uh, it, it went the way a lot of role-playing games go, in that it, it eventually fell over in, in a heap of its own internal contradictions and, and, and stupidity and power escalations. Um, but the first, the first, the first quite large chunk of it, um, I thought went, oh, "This is a good story. This is with some good characters." Um, so after we'd finished it, I thought, "I'll write it up." And then as I was writing it up, I thought, well, why write it up as notes? Why not turn it into a novel? You could write, you could dramatize it a bit. You wouldn't have to do very much, Steve. Wouldn't have much. <laughs> uh, so all right. So I ended so this was what this became. Um this became one of the novels that I asked John to try and sell about the place. Uh, I still couldn't write very well. It's noticeably better than the first one, but uh, but I, I'm referring to it now in writing the Moonsteel Crown and going, oh God, you thought that sentence was good. <laughs> Why would you use those words like that? Oh, um, but yeah, the Moonsteel Crown is basically uh, it is basically the same story with the same characters. Um, they're a bit snarkier than they were, but not hugely. Um, and yeah, so it does kind of feel like I've gone 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 full circle. Only now I like to think I can uh, I can do sentence slinging good now, better than I could before. Anyway. Um, so that's been yeah so that story had been kicking around for a long time and and and, uh, and when angry robot i can't remember how I, whether i think my agent was ferreting around and angry robot had gone through a bit of a bit of a moment shall we say <clears throat> um and were kind of actively looking for, for for people to put on their lists um so it was a case of well, would you like to write write for angry? Would I, you like to write? Hold on, no, let edit this out, please. <laughs> would you like to write for angry robot some fantasy? Uh, all right, I'll, if I can write this, then yes. Yeah, all right then. All right, I guess I'm writing that then. And it's such a joy. It really is to go back to that. I don't know whether it's fantasy in general or whether it's just because it's that story and that story has been around with me for so long, mm. but I haven't had this much pleasure from writing first drafts for 10 books or so. Wow. They'd become a bit of a, they'd become a bit of a labor. I would kind of found that first drafts were hard work mm -hmm. and, and I was starting to enjoy the rewriting much more than the first drafts, which is completely ass about, face from where i started yeah. but now with this i find i'm right i'm back to i'm back to i'm back to really enjoying just writing out that first draft and that's that's a that's a really nice feeling and and it gives me a kind of hope that the book that comes out at the end might be quite good we shall see it's really oh I, I don't mean that i mean read it read it and find <laughs> out it's really yeah. good just to read it but yes well for re i haven't read the book yet it's on my shelf to read um but from reading the back it sounds like almost um, i mean some books are very involved in the world events this one to, to, from what i've read of it, it sounds like there's a lot of big stuff going on and there's this group of criminals 
going off yeah. and trying to basically profit from their own, do their own, make money whilst the war's going on, and they kind of get sucked in indirectly. They're just people on the on the fringes. Yeah, yeah. That, that, well, that's that that's very much the case, but particularly in the first book, the the the, uh, the the three main protagonists are are all a bunch of people who kind of want to stay under the radar for different reasons, and yeah. and they are. They're not unsavory characters, um, but they're not particularly virtuous either. And and so they they're kind of going, oh, there's some there's some big world events going on, and maybe 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 there's a maybe we can like slide into the edges of that and 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 make a bit of profit um, and, and slide away again. And so that they 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 do this, and then they're like, ah. Fuck! We're caught up in big world events. Get it out of here. Get it away. Get it away. Make it stop. <laughs> um, yeah. So they spend the first like you know, the first act of the book, I suppose. They're sort of trying to do their sneaky thievy <clears throat> thing, and then and then the rest of the book is trying to run away from the consequences of what they've done. Um, in such a way that they don't get hunted down forever by people who are absolutely going to kill them if they find them. <laughs> We're doing something yeah. a little naughty whilst accidentally getting sucked into everything that's going on. Yeah, so we're just going to steal a bit of you know, something vaguely important. They weren't really expecting to steal the crown. <laughs> I think the title gives it away a bit there. But... <laughs> Little little clues, yes. Some little clues that give them away. Did, did you were these characters? Were these three characters. Did you make them up new? They weren't from the role playing. Oh no, they were from the role playing game. Oh Absolutely. right, okay. Yeah, yeah. You just adapted um, them a bit. Uh, yes, they, yeah. They, they are they are adapted versions of other people's player characters. Um. So uh, one of whom is my wife. So she's jolly happy. So she got certain. She read it and she got like ownership of the characters. Going, I, I'm not sure I would do that. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it's funny because she, she she refuses to read it um, because it, it's a, this won't be. I know that this is a dramatization of of this game, and I remember the game. I remember this character, and you've changed some of the names as well. I remember this character being this way, and this character being this way, and you won't have written them exactly that way and so it'll jar for me so i shouldn't so i'm not going i'm not going to read it and then she sneakily went away and listened to the audio book um and has apparently fallen in love with the narrator's interpretation of my interpretation of at least one of the characters so i guess i guess i guess it must have been reasonably close um i did have to make a you know certain amount of changes um but not nearly as many as you might think. That's good. That's good. So you've got this whole world and you've done the first book and there's a sequel within the same world. Is that right? Uh, yes, yes. So they, 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 the story, the characters continue. I try to write these kinds of books so that at the end of the first book, the story, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, the plot has completed yep. but the characters clearly have ongoing lives and their lives have been changed by what has happened and and it may be that because of the changes that have happened to their in in their lives they are now going to do go and do something else that turns out to be oh look there's the plot of book two for you mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so yeah it, it's it's kind of like that um in, in book book one they're, they're very much caught up in, in in a thing they don't want any part of in book two, it's much more of a personal. That they're, they're they're all on personal journeys that were kicked off in book one, uh, so it's really about. For for two of them, it's about uh, trying to resolve the things that had got them into the situation that they were in in the first place, um, in quite different ways. And for the for the third one, for things, it's it's a case of. Well, these are my friends, and if I don't hang around stopping them from doing something stupid, then they inevitably will. So I better be there and might steal a few things while I'm at it. Here, um, <clears throat> now that's uh, he's he's got a bit of a personal story going on. I forget that sometimes. Uh, and and these world events that started in book one are 
continuing and the characters are still the characters are still trying to ignore them uh, and this time that's not going to work nearly as well as it did last time and in book three they are and it's they are kind of intimately caught up in them whether they like it or not okay, okay. if book three exists but that's why i'm writing at the moment right right do you think how we consume media has changed how you write fantasy novels in the approach that you know you just said that the first book is standalone ish but it continues in another adventure and the days of 22 episodes seasons seven seasons a show and they're all interconnected it's kind of fading and those the, the long-running series i know there are some i know like brandon sanson's doing his 10 mega book thing whatever it is and malazan but that was done that's done and dusted um do you think those days are gone generally for the rest of, for like the 10 book the 20 book series thing uh quite sure how to answer that <laughs> um okay confession time go on uh Remember earlier on, I said that in the, the second Dragon series, I drew in the, I merged the first two series. Yep. Okay. Right. The Moonsteel Crown fits in there as well. <laughs> so actually, kind of, this is book eleven of, I don't know how many would end up being seventeen. Um, but I'm not. Uh, I, I don't have the kind of presence of someone of, of a Martin or a, or a Sanderson. Um, I have to accept the reality that. I'm lucky to get a three book contract. Uh, I am never going to get a 10, well, ten book contract. Uh, almost, well, you can probably count the number of fantasy authors on the fingers of two hands who, who would ever get a 10 book contract. Um, so that's not going to happen. So the only way to make that kind of grand epic that I really kind of want to do um, <laughs> work is to split the story into story into interlinking stories yeah so here's a trilogy uh here's a trilogy set 20 years later in a different place here's a trilogy that uh in which the events of both of those trilogies are relevant and some of the same characters appear here's a trilogy set 10 years in between in the in between these the first two uh with a different set of characters some of whom may start to appear later in other things um the so, so the, the the in the Moonsteel Crown, Myla's Myla is a sword monk, and her she mentions her teacher, her, who who the, the 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 monk who taught her, mm -hmm. and in book two when you will meet that monk, well that monk also taught the thief taker's apprentice, uh, and was a, a, a at a much younger age a moderately significant character in the second book in that series but only the second book so the main characters tend not to move across but some of the minor ones do mm. and, and and i i i mean it's a difficult balancing act you'll never please everyone but i'm trying to do is write stories that are complete but interlinked yeah uh, and that together will tell a bigger story whether or not that works or not i don't know I'll tell you. Right, you tell me when it's when it's finished. If anyone actually reads all of them, so you've got Easter eggs all the way through. It's just if uh, people know what they're if they've read the other books, they're going to. Yeah, I, I, and there's there's uh, I've seen a review up on Goodreads that's absolutely frightening from someone who clearly has and not only has spotted all the Easter eggs, but wow. has spotted some Easter eggs that I didn't realise I'd put in. And now, <laughs> Um, one That's or two impressive. Possible, yeah, well, it's one or two possible course corrections might be necessary for the. <laughs> as a, uh, I've had to go back and read something I wrote like seven years ago. Going, did I really say that? <laughs> it doesn't actually conflict with anything I did, but did, but oh, I wasn't quite going to go that way. Shit, I need to. Oh crap, that changes what. Ah. <laughs> so yes, thank you, Claire. Wow, a review that's changed the course of book three. That's. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> you need that person to build you a wiki so you can yeah. just uh, yeah. refer back to. I guess that's the only danger of having so everything so interconnected. You can, so can I, trip. I, I think, well, yes, especially when you have to drop it and come back to it and drop it and come back to it. Mm. Um, I, I don't think those days are over. Um, I think we, I think a lot of us fantasy authors still want that kind of 
just massive scale thing if we can get away with it but it's very very hard to do yeah. um it, it's it's very hard to sell it yeah. uh, i i think the i think the days of having a series that just goes on where where the story doesn't end at the end of book one and then a new story starts at the end of book two um which kind of picks it up again and you might have a a larger overarching story but 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 it's not the dominant story in any individual book i think those days may have largely gone uh, i i'm i'm under the impression and have been for some years that what what a lot of publishers are really looking for is a fantasy or science fiction where the where it can be a series where the characters are you now it's the same characters and the characters evolve and their relationships evolve but they're fundamentally set in the same precinct and at the end of the series everything's kind of back the way it was but also can we have a big epic arc as well just one that doesn't look like it's ever not resolved and, and no you can't it doesn't work that way <laughs> anyway <clears throat> so i and, and you, talk, you talk about media I, the number of series that i've watched now where they just stop at the end of season one they just stop mid fucking fight just total cliffhanger at the end of season one. It, it seems that, that it is an increasingly I don't care attitude. We'll resolve it in season two and just assume that we're going to get one. All right. Don't yeah. like that, I have to say. I prefer my seasons and my stories to reach a, to largely reach a conclusion. Something's hanging is fine, but the main story should reach a, I feel should reach a conclusion. Yeah, with, with so much streaming and so many platforms so much kind of thing that kind of risk just seems quite crazy to me when when shows are getting cancelled all the time to take that kind of a gamble yeah um, maybe they're thinking oh well we'll get we'll come back if we end on a cliffhanger nope just means the viewers don't get a satisfying ending ever yeah. that's yeah. it we never find out how it's resolved yeah which annoys and me that, yeah yeah <laughs> warrior nun i'm looking at you among others has that been has that been cancelled i don't know if it was cancelled but oh. it sort of stopped at mid fight in season one right okay I, i've got that to watch there again if it's, if it's not coming back and i know it ends on a cliffhanger i'm, I'm probably not going to start it <laughs> it just ends mid fight mm. it's not the only one by any means it's just one i happen to remember Is yeah. it, 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 it really was a you just what that can't be you can't just stop there you literally stopped in the middle of the climax. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think doing that with novels is just not feasible anymore. You have to have a more episodic fe episodic feel to a book, but also builds. And if you do well, as you say, do a series of series within the same world or the same universe, so that somewhere there's connective tissue. I think. Uh, I mean, I could understand it if a publisher decided to take a different model and say right well we'll contract you for your three books and we're going to put them out all together with a very short spacing between them mm. so when the first one comes out everyone knows that books two and three are done because they are already in production yep. and 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 you can have your cliffhanger and that's fine because next month the next one's going to be there yeah um but no one really does that so the only one that's done that recently, though, again, as you said, it's different rules for the big boys. Jim Butcher did that for his last Dresden novel because it was such a big novel. He ended up breaking in two and he had, it came out in, I think, July and then like September. But you knew the rest of the story was coming in two months in a new book and that was it. But uh, yeah, that's, it's pretty rare that that kind of thing happens. Yeah. Very rare. Um, we had a question from from someone from America who was asking you about. So you included them in the Silver Kings. Um, oh, Ray, hi Ray. Yeah, <laughs> Ray. As he wants to know if uh, he, he's going to appear in the the Moonsteel Crown. 
He wants to know if Zafir is going to appear in the Moonsteel Crown. Well, not in the Moonsteel Crown, but 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 in a sequel, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I've had this question from several <laughs> people, actually. So they are talking about the Dragon Queen. The, right. the, 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 oh, I don't know how to describe her. Um, she was certainly one of the antagonists in the first dragon book, but in the second series, she kind of got to, she kind of got to be the main character. And I ended up rather liking her. And so did, I guess, quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of people who read the books mm. found the fear to be the character they they stuck to. Um, you say hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, give her a dragon and then let her loose, and and and, and an entire continent burns, and that's pretty much what happens. Um, uh, yeah, so Zephyr is the dragon queen, uh, arguably responsible for the destruction of most of the world. Uh, uh has a good go at a second one uh yeah and they want to know whether she's going to come back because she doesn't die at the end um that's that's not too much of a spoiler it, 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 there's not there's no ambiguity about that i do yeah. sometimes leave characters in ambiguous places but not not in this case um so ray and and Laura and Claire, other Claire. Uh, <clears throat> if you've paid attention to the rest of this, you'll know that that I'm trying to write something which has got lots of trilogies that all stick together to a bigger story. And it won't stop with the Moonsteel Crown trilogy if it gets that far. If I am allowed to continue, there will be at least one book after the Moonsteel Crown that does not include any dragons. And then after that, I'm not sure whether it would be the next one or the one after, but you're getting close. And if you let, if, if the world lets me keep on going, you'll get the fear back in the end. Yes. Hey, okay. Okay. <laughs> Ray and others, you have an answer. You have an answer now. You're going to have to wait at least four books, and that's provided I get publishers who want to publish them. Okay, okay. Well, it's good that you've got fans asking about particular characters. Obviously, you obviously created a very popular one there with the readers that they're uh, asking for her. Yeah, so I know she she kind of just took over in the second series. It's like, right, you've you you fuckers, you've really really fucked me over, and I'm really pissed off really really pissed off and angry and i have a dragon and now you are going to face the consequences of those things bye (laughs) sounds destructive and dangerous and uh dramatic i like to think of the last the last act of dragon queen as call of duty dragon warfare um yeah that was a Great fun to write that sequence. Great fun to write. Excellent. Excellent. Well, the Moonstein Crown is out now. Your work, the sequel is out probably next year, I'm guessing. Uh, I don't have a specific date from Angry Robot, but yeah. there's no particular reason to think it won't come out around about a year after. Yeah. Uh, it's following the same the same cycle of so yeah it should be it's not in my control but i'm not slowing it down let's put it that yeah, way it's done and you're already working on book three so you're ahead of the game well i like to finish book three i like to try and finish the next book before i edit do my final you know edit with notes back from the editor yeah. on the on the previous book because it kind of helps to iron out any inconsistencies and what i do find writing like stories that go across multiple books is that you quite often discover in a later book that it would really have been convenient if you'd set something small up in the previous book (laughs) so it's nice to make that discovery when you still have the opportunity to do so uh yes yeah was it's gone to familiar feelings dude well (laughs) 
Yes, yes. I did I, I did two connected trilogies and it was during the second trilogy I thought, oh, wouldn't it be good if I'd set up X? Oh bugger, it's far too late. I there's no yeah. I can do anything about that now. Shit. So mm, okay, let's find another way to, to solve this problem. We see connected trilogies. Yeah, you know, we, we can't get away from it, can we? We just want those bigger stories, bigger and bigger stories. Yeah. Yeah, I, and as you say, no matter what you do, you can't please anybody. If you do standalone books that are connected, some people are happy. If you do one big story and it's just a split across three books, some people are happy, some are not. So I, I'm not, I, I know not that I'd started, but I, I'm not writing for someone else. You know, I'm just writing how I want to do it. So I think, I think at the moment, if I, I hope we'll offer any advice to a, to a sort of newish author would certainly be do not try and sell a a 10 book series or a seven book series or a six book series or anything larger than a three book series fine if you have in your head that there will be another three book series that happens to continue the first three book series or link to it or so forth but as things stand at the moment we have several very high profile, very popular authors who are very spectacularly and obviously and high profilely failing to complete their series. And that is making publishers quite wary because it's getting a bit of a backlash from readers, rightly or wrongly. Uh, I, I'm not going to comment on that. It's very frustrating as a reader, but I understand it as a writer. Um, but it's making publishers wary. And also, I know of a series, I, there was a series that I really, really enjoyed the first book of. It was just so gloriously atmospheric. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Wolfhound Century, that was it. Published by Golantz uh, a few years after I first. Um, had some issues with the, with the ending, but the, the, oh, the, the atmosphere was just so different and so gorgeously different gray and russian and 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 kind of graham green only high fantasy graham green how did you do that how does that even work together and yet it did uh and my as i understand it it was supposed to be a seven book series and they just didn't take him up after the first three so it oh, just wow. it just pieces out it just stops um and you don't want that to happen to your series no no, you really don't. You really don't. Yeah, anything beyond a trilogy at this point is just uh, unlikely to happen. Um, yeah, some readers, I've heard some readers say they won't pick up a series until it's finished, which is problematic for lots of reasons. Um, but I, I, yeah, a lot of us, I guess, I got painted by a, a bigger brush. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I understand that. As a reader, I understand that, but for us mid-list authors, it is uh, basically holding us in a chokehold. <laughs> but we're ahead. As you said, you've already written book two. You're working on book three. I've already written book two. It's done. I'm now working on something completely new. Mine's only two book series, and it's, so it's, it's, it's out next year. I'll be editing it later this year, but it's finished. Well, I'm very aware that I'm taking quite a chance by working on book three without having a contract for book three, because that might not happen because no one will buy the Rune Steel Crown until the <laughs> second book comes out, by which time it will be too late. But you'll have written a satisfying ending for you, even for yourself, you'll have done uh, it, you know. Okay, if it gets that bad, I'll self-publish the damn thing. <laughs> it's not that difficult. It's changed a lot, self-publishing back then, as you said, compared to now. It's such a... A different animal it's, it's easy to do it's hard to do it well yeah yeah definitely yeah there's not nearly as much stigma attached to self-publishing now as i used to be it was uh it was a very gray back then um and i know a lot of authors who are kind of hybrids now they do self-publishing and traditional publishing so it's uh, it's doable these days too yeah i can i can see that i can see that might have become a lot more common actually thinking about it yeah with contracts mm. and the way things are so i think we'll leave it there for tonight uh, as we said the moon steel crown is out 
The cowd comes out in June, so check them out, both an angry robot. There's a discount code below to buy signed copies from the Broken Binding, so have a look there. And Stephen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Stephen, for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back soon. Good night, everyone. Cheers.